Okay, so at the end of the last video, I mentioned something called equivalence relations. I said that that's what we're going to talk about next time, and now is next time, so let's talk about those. So, what is an equivalence relation? Well, here's our definition. We're going to say, let R be a relation, let R be a relation on a set A. R is an equivalence relation, so R will be an equivalence relation if R will be an equivalence relation if R is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So and transitive. So that's our definition of an equivalence relation. An equivalence relation is one if the relation is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Now let's just like refresh our memory on what those mean because maybe we don't remember what reflexive, symmetric, and transitive mean. I mean, we just went over it, so maybe it's not fresh in your mind. Okay, so what does it mean to be reflexive? So we'll say R is reflexive, R is reflexive, and then I'll just impl imply on a set A. So R is reflexive if for all x in A, x relates to x, right? And now what does symmetric mean? Let's use another color, right? So we'll say R is symmetric. R is symmetric if for all x in A, oh, for all x, y in A, sorry, for all x, y in A, if x relates to y, then y relates to x. So we suppose that x relates to y. If from there we can prove that y relates to x, then r is symmetric. Now finally, r, uh, let's use another color. Let's, uh, let's use green. We'll say r is transitive. r is transitive if for all x, y, z, and a, so x, y, and z, there are arbitrary elements at a, when x relates to y, and y relates to x, uh, not y relates to x, y relates to z, then x relates to z. So we suppose x relates to y, and y relates to z, and if we can show then from those two claims that x relates to z, then r is going to be transitive, right? So there's a little refresher for you. Now, what I want to do is I want to talk about a new kind of relationship. Maybe, maybe you've heard of it before, maybe you haven't. Either way, it's something that's going to keep coming up in classes like um, number theory, for example, um, in abstract algebra. This is going to be a kind of relation that you see for the rest of your mathematical career. So let's introduce it. What we're going to talk about now is congruence modulo n. Has anyone ever heard of modulo arithmetic? I definitely did not before taking discrete, but it's actually pretty cool. So congruence modulo n, what does that mean? Let's write out a definition. <clears throat> Let's let n be a positive integer, right? Let's let n be a positive integer. We say, so we say, two integers, two integers, x and y, so x and y are arbitrary, are congruent, are congruent modulo n, and sometimes people will shorten modulo and just say mod, Let's say congruent mod n. So we say two integers, x and y, are congruent mod n, provided, provided, n divides x minus y. And in symbols to write um to write that x and y are congruent mod n, what we say is x three lines, so this is x is congruent to y mod n. Sometimes people omit the parentheses. I think the parentheses are kind of just there to help like it, it looks better if you're writing out a whole proof. Um I usually omit the parentheses, but you can keep them if it's better for you visually. 
So that's how we write it out. So x is congruent to y mod n, provided n divides x minus y. So let's do a couple of examples real quick, right? Um, I'm going to just think of numbers off the top of my head. Uh, let's say, and let's use, let's use a blue color for this, right? So is 5 congruent to, oh, why don't I put a line through that? So is 5 congruent to 8 mod, 8 mod 3, right here? And I'll put the parentheses. Well, how do we know if it is congruent? Well, we just need to check if n divides x minus y. So in this case, n is 3. x is what? x is 5. And 8 is our y, right? So we have 3 divides negative 3. And that's true. So it's true. 5 is congruent to 8 mod 3. Now, what about, let's do, I don't know. Let's do, uh, is 25 congruent to 15? Odd 5. Well, yes, that's true, right? Why? Because 5 divides 25 minus 15, which is 5 divides 10, right? 2 times 5 is 10. So that's congruent. Now, what about, let's say, um, is 7 congruent to, uh, I don't know, 3 mod 3? Well, let's see. Does 3 divide 7 minus 3, right? So this is the same as asking if 3 divides 4, which is not the case. There's no integer such that 3, no integer, let's say, x, such that 3x is equal to 4, right? So 7 is not congruent to 3 mod 3. And like with every other relation, if we want to say not, we just stick a line through it. So the three horizontal lines with a vertical or maybe its diagonal line through it um, means not congruent. So those are a couple of examples and a non-example. So hopefully this is making a bit more sense to you. Um, you might be wondering, well, Johnny, why are we talking about equivalence relations and now we're talking about congruence modulo n? The reason that is, is because congruence mod n is actually an equivalence relation, right? But you shouldn't trust me on that. I should have to prove it to you. And that's what I'm going to do right now. So here's my claim. So I'm claiming that congruence modulo n is an equivalence relation on the integers, right? So how exactly are we going to prove this, right? Well, let's look at our definition of being an equivalence relation, right? So R must be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Thus, if I want to show that something is an equivalence relation, I need to show that it has those three properties, right? So that's not too difficult, especially for this example. That's why I'm doing it. Um, it's something you could definitely do on your own. So I would encourage you to pause the video and try to figure this out for yourself. Show that it's reflexive that it is symmetric, transitive, and then you'll show that it's an equivalence relation. All right, so now I'm going to go through the proof with you now. So we, we let R, I'll just say, let R be the relation, let R be the relation congruence mod n. Uh, we'll just, you know, we'll just do this. We'll put our low congruence symbol. So let R be that relation. Let x be an arbitrary integer. Integer. We'll show, we'll show that our relation is reflexive, right? I'm going to swap up the colors that we were using earlier. So we're going to show that this is reflexive. Well, let's see something. We want to show that x relates to x, right? Clearly, clearly, n divides x minus x since n times 0 is equal to x minus x, which equals 0. So our relationship, our relation is reflexive, right? And that's all it took to show that it was reflexive, right? We wanted to show that x relates to x. Well, guess what? For that to occur, we just need to show that n divides x minus x, which it definitely does, because n divides 0. So we showed that it was reflexive in one sentence, right? Okay. We'll now show, we'll now show that congruence is symmetric. <laughs> congruence is symmetric, right? All right. Let x comma y be integers remember this is our oh that's a uh, it's not how you do it 
This is our symbol for the integers, z with like a second line. So let x, y be integers. Suppose, suppose x relates to y. What can we, what can kind of conclusion can we draw from that? Uh, let's see. So x relates to y. So we'll say then n divides x minus y. Now let's remind ourselves, what do we want to show? We want to show that n divides y minus x. We want to show that y relates to x. Well, how can we get there? Then n divides x minus y. So we'll say, so there exists an integer a such that n times a is equal to x minus y, right? Now here's what I'm going to do. Multiplying, oh, I have to write tiny. Multiplying both sides of the equality, so multiplying both sides of the equality yields, what do we get from that? Do you see where I'm going? Multiplying both sides of the equality, oh, I didn't even see what we were multiplying by, by negative 1 yields, what do we get? We get negative na is equal to negative x minus y, right? And so now this is the same thing as n times negative a is equal to y minus x, right? And now from this, now I'm kind of leaving out words. So this isn't too formal, but you, I, I want to show you the bigger picture. So now this implies that n divides y minus x, right? Because we showed that there exists an integer such that n times that integer equals y minus x, namely negative a, right? So we showed that n divides y minus x. Thus, y is congruent to x mod n. So congruence is symmetric. Great. All right, we are on the final stretch. Don't worry, this is the coolest one, transitivity, right? So finally, finally we'll show that congruence is transitive. All right, and we used green for that earlier, so we're going back to that. So we're going to say let x, y, z be integers. Suppose x relates to y and y relates to z. Now this is going to go crazy. Are you ready for this? Okay. So if we know that x relates to y and y relates to z, then we know that n divides x minus y and n divides y minus z. There we go, n divides y minus z. Thus, right, there exist integers, so there exist, let's say a and b, integers a and b. God, I keep writing that z wrong a and b such that a divides let's say x minus y and um oh wait hold on what am i doing that's wrong so we say there exists integers a and b such that n a is equal to x minus y and n b is equal to y minus z i'm going to scroll up a little bit so we get some more room all right so that's all good and well now let's say Adding, adding n a and n b yields. Let's say we're going to yield this equality. N a plus n b is equal to. Now remember, n a is equal to x minus y, and n b is equal to y minus z. So we add y minus z. And now our y's cancel out. So now what we're left with is n times a plus b, so we're undistributing the n, equals x minus z. Now, a and b are just integers, right? So their sum is an integer. Let's call it c. So n times c is equal to x minus z. Now we have found an integer such that n times that integer equals x minus z. What can we draw from that? Well, that must mean that n divides x minus z. Thus, z or x is congruent to z 
Oh god, I'm writing everything wrong. X is congruent to Z mod N. So congruence is transitive. Now we're on the final stretch. We're not done yet. We have to say, since congruence is reflexive, since congruence is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, so it's symmetric, reflexive, and transitive, congruence mod n is an equivalence relation is an equivalence relation and we're done that's the end of the proof so it looks like a lot it's really not that much and i still believe it's something that you could do on your own for the first time um if this didn't make sense i would encourage you to just go back sit pause watch the video try to rewrite what i was doing and make it make sense for yourself. Um, I didn't put all the words in, like I said before, when we got to like the symmetric part, I just kind of started writing arrows to show this implies that. But yeah, we just went through, we showed that it was reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, and so it's an equivalence relation. Now, next time, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about um, equivalence classes, right? And we're going to show how congruence mod n can kind of partition the integers into these congruence uh, uh yeah into these equivalence classes which is a pretty cool idea so if you made it to the end of this video thank you for watching i really appreciate it and i hope you learned something